Okay, this is a follow-up video on the whole business about evolution. It was initially intended, you know, on towards a better atheism. What I was trying to explain in an atheism scam that the evolutionists, the Darwinians anyway, prove that they everything they say makes them too dumb to live. Because you could take that passage that I just highlighted in blue especially right here and that's a decree of evolution the question is what kind of evolution is it it is definitely not the Darwinian evolution pandered by you know Richard Dawkins and his ilk because Darwinian evolution doesn't even work mathematically or genetically. And Darwin himself was a, a failed Anglican clergyman. So of course he couldn't think his way out of a paper bag. The only thing he came up with was something Gregor Mendel, who was a monk, came up with years before, that there's such a thing as mutation. And Darwin didn't know anything about genetics, and Darwin didn't know anything about math, and he clearly didn't know anything about Bible, because look at that highlight in blue. Okay? After their kind. Right there. That's simple genetics. We all know about the genetics. By the way, if you're hearing a noise in the background, it's a bunch of cicadas. They're right outside my window. This is their season for making a little rattling sound. Okay, after their kind. Now cicadas that you'll hear rattle every once in a while. The cicadas have been around forever. Okay, they're still cicadas, but there are now many different versions of them. In other words, how old the earth is, 2 billion years ago, 5 billion years ago, 11 billion years ago, however old creation is, or call it, the, just the universe, if you don't want to use creation as a word. Cicadas were here. They were in different sizes, different shapes, different colors, but they basically had the same characteristics. Okay, a lot of people think that today's insects are like vestiges of yesterday's dinosaurs, and that could be. All right? There are many different kinds of evolutionary theories that have been out forever. Even the ancients, like Aristotle, were trying to figure out what evolution was. And even, you know, like I said, Gregor Mendel, who was a monk. The whole idea of evolution itself has been around forever. The Darwinian flavor is the one that doesn't work. But even if you were to pander the Darwinian flavor, this isn't telling you what flavor of evolution God ordained. It's just saying he did it. So Darwin didn't know how to read the Bible. Dawkins can't read the Bible. None of the people who are advocating that evolution proves the Bible wrong, they can't read the Bible at all. And I already showed you, and you can look at my Genesis playlist, that the Bible never says that the earth is only 6,000 years old. It doesn't say anything about how old it is at all, period. Okay, so take a minute and look at that, because we're going we're gonna to talk about what God's evolution is. I should have said that before, and I'm going to cover it now. Just look at that for a few seconds. See, God issues a command. He sets a thing in motion. He says, let it bring forth okay after their kind in other words God is not going to do this directly he's going to set some kind of thing in motion which we now know as genetics okay so that every kind comes forth and it says God made the beasts of the earth after their kind when you make something you can make an order and it's the same thing as making it especially if all God has to do is speak a thing into existence that doesn't mean he directly has to make it. 
and there is a real point that God's making here about the fact that he isn't doing it directly. He's issuing an order. See? He said, God said, and it was so. Well, what was so? The genetics. Not all the beasts came into being in instantly. Okay? They're saying, he's, he's saying it was so at that time. It became, it was there. It was true. Well, God said light be and it was so. Your existence is many years later than the order here. The animals that exist today are many years later than the order here. The order here is on the sixth day uh, or what was it? The which day of restoration? Fifth day. Fifth day. On the fifth day of the restoration, not initial creation of the earth, God says something. You and I weren't there then. The animals and the locusts, the cicadas, you know, screaming outside, they weren't there then. He decreed it. That's all he did. This is really important to what I, to this, the point of this video. God says a thing and he sets into motion a procedure. Now you can argue all day as to what kind of evolution this is. Okay? It cannot be the Darwinian version because the Darwinian version insists on magic. God doesn't do magic. God himself is not magic and he doesn't do magic. I have more power than an ant. Compared to the ant, I'm supernatural. Compared to me, God is supernatural, but the powers that God has are natural to him. That shouldn't be too hard to understand. Okay, so he can speak a whole procedure into existence. And then that procedure has its own life. God give, and I'm going to get into this in this, God gives us individual life as, suppo as opposed to just speaking a procedure into existence. That's the difference in God's evolution. That's the theme of this video. Okay? God says procedure after their kind. They do it themselves. Okay? And it was so. The procedure was set in motion. Over what period of time? Who knows? Okay? For all you know, this is the second time he's issuing the command because this is a restoration of the world. And because there were already living things at the time he issues this command. See, because he's talking about the earth. The sea is already there. The marine animals and marine life is already there. It's a restoration. So now he's talking about the earth. He's talking about cattle which live above ground, on the ground, and creeping things, and beasts of the earth after their kind. So he's not talking about marine life. He's talking about world he's talking about, you know, on the ground life. Well, because the ground was underwater and he drained it, and now he's saying, Okay, set the procedure in motion. Was it fast? Was it slow? Well, the evolutionists that are not Darwinians are debating that. Take your pick which one you want. But the one you know that doesn't work from science alone is the Darwinian version. The number of genetic mutations that a being can go through before it dies are very few. The genes cannot take the load of a mutation beyond a certain corridor. And any geneticist will tell you that. It doesn't matter. It, this has nothing to do with believing in God. This has to do with sheer genetics. The same thing is true in math. A mutation of plus one, plus one, plus one inside a set. If your set is one through ten, you cannot have the number eleven. It won't go that far. So genetics is like set theory in math. It has a number of attributes that can go so far there's so many ways that genetic attributes can change before they die. That's why Darwinian evolution relies on magic rather than fact, rather than science. There's nothing scientific about Darwinian evolution, and it wasn't invented by a scientist. It was invented by a disgruntled clergyman. So throw Darwin out. You know, maybe along the way he had a couple of good insights. Who knows? 
but there's nothing magic about evolution. Every atheist will tell you that there's nothing magic about it. Exactly. So Darwinian evolution doesn't qualify as a kind of evolution that's in view here. Because Darwinian evolution relies on magic to, to function. And there's never been any proof that it works. There are other theories of evolution that work. Or might work. We don't know. The point I'm trying to make here is this is a decree for it. Which kind of evolution? I don't know. I only know what kind it isn't. I only know that it's not Darwin's because of the genetics, the limits on genetics. Genetic mutation is limited. Just like in set theory, there's a limit on the way the numbers can change. Look at fractals. There's a limit on the way the shapes change. Okay, there's always a, a, a certain corridor of change. Okay, so you with me on that? I wanted to I want to just get past this whole stupid argument that people are wasting billions of dollars on over evolution. Yeah, evolution right here. Is it Darwinian? No, because Darwinian doesn't work. What other kind is it? Well, I don't know. Let the scientists debate that. But God decreed it. It's right here. Now, it's a procedure. It's a process. It's independent of God. He's decreeing an independent process. You get that, don't you? Let the earth, the, he, God's not doing it, he's saying earth is going to do it, bring forth living creatures after their kind. Okay? How is that done? I don't know. I don't care, to be honest. Whatever science comes up with, it's a hypothesis and you play with it and that's fine. But God's decreeing it right here. So all of you Christians who are busy arguing against the evolutionists, stop it. You're wasting your time and you're wasting everybody's money. And their time, too. And all you evolutionists who think that evolution disproves God, well, here's a verse proving it doesn't. So Richard Dawkins is an idiot because he can't even read verse 24 in English. And all the others with him. They think, oh, evolution disproves the Bible. No, it doesn't. It's right here. Duh. Okay, sorry. Now, so God's decree is a decree to make them. So it's the same thing as if God did it directly, but he did not, repeat, did not do it directly. He's authorizing an agent here. So it's the same because he decreed it as if he did it personally, but he did not do it personally. You see this? He did not do it personally. That's the point of this video. He didn't do it personally. He ascribed, he set forth, he decreed an agent other than himself. This was a big question mark in Christianity years ago. I already explained this in the Summa Theologica by Thomas Aquinas. He was trying to figure out what did God do directly and what did he do indirectly. Okay, this is an example of indirect creation. Procreation amongst biological beings, okay, is another example. But now look at the difference, and this is the theme of the audio. God said, let us make man in our image and our likeness, and then let them rule over. God is saying, I'm going to directly create man, directly, individually. In other words, God directly made you. God directly made me. God directly made the next person. Psalm 139, if anybody would translate it properly, says that the biology that we call our bodies and mistake for our real selves, that biology is just a house. The real you is made in God's own image. Well, but God's invisible. God's immaterial. God has no mass, has no energy, is the author of it all. Math has no mass and no energy and rules everything. Everything in the world, every kind of science you ever want to mention is ruled by some kind of math principle. Genetics is a good example of that. Genetics is like biological math, really. That's why we can analyze it so well. But this is not discernible biologically. This is not discernible physically. 
This is not discernible by means of energy. The most you can do is say that thought exists because there's an effect on the brain, but you cannot open the brain and read thought from it. It's not like reading a hard drive. The brain is a hard drive, but the material stored on it, you can't read. Why? Because God's saying, man is immaterial. The real you is directly made by God individually at birth. And the verse that specifically says that is right here. God formed man out from the dust of the ground. In other words, your biologic, your biological body. But then God breathed into the nostrils. That means the body is outside, not inside a womb. Breathed into his nostrils. And then the Hebrew here is plural. The breath of lives, plural. And only then does man become living. In other words, this part is not living. It's after this happens that this becomes living. And I've, I've, I'm slowly making videos in my pro-life blasphemy series to show that the Bible assiduously contends that God alone makes you you at birth, not before, and you have no progenitors. Because the decree is make man in our image, our likeness. You are immaterial. The real you is immaterial. This is why the hell question matters. You're never going to die. If you're made in God's image, you can't die. Your body dies, but you don't. So where are you going to live after you die? That's the big question. If your body's a house, well, it's like moving from one house to another house. The real you picks up all your stuff in physical life and moves to another house, okay? The, the real soul, which is you, made in God's image, is gonna be transported to another house. Okay, which house? The house in heaven or the house in hell? Which body are you gonna occupy after this one? Okay, that's the Bible's argument. I'm not saying you should believe what I'm saying. I'm just trying to show what the Bible's argument is. You are not evolved solely because you are not biological. What you walk around in is a biological machine and it will, as it were, die. It will cease to function. But the real you goes on living because God wants man to be made in God's image according to our likeness, which is, you know, poetic language for having a soul. And the Bible's real clear about the fact that the real you is your soul. Okay? See? Dust of the ground, but he's not alive. Breathed into his nostrils. God directly, God directly breathes into the body the breath of lives. And then man becomes living, not before. See, God directly does this. This is just this is the exact opposite of what's up here in verse 24. God is letting the earth do the creation here. But God himself does the creation here. That's the distinction. You do not have any progenitors. Not monkeys, not anybody. Even your own parents merely are just parented, as it were, the biology. The real you is directly made by God. Now why is why do that? Why? Are you enough with me that you understand this? God is doing this directly in contradistinction to verse 24. Verse 24, God is ordering somebody else to do the work. And namely, it's just all biological. It's a procedure of evolution of some kind. The only kind I'm sure of that it isn't, it isn't Darwinian, because Darwinian evolution doesn't work genetically. Okay? But it is something. And maybe some other version of evolution is right. And there are a whole lot of atheists who believe in other forms of evolution. Fine. I mean, it, the whole evolution question has nothing to do with God. Except that if you're going to talk about it, right here is your verse saying God decreed it. Okay? But this is an indirect process. This is something else causing biological life at God's order. Okay? 
But the difference between you and the rest of what you see and feel is that God directly made the real you and the real you is your soul. Neshema. Shema is a word used in Hebrew for the soul. And that's in plural there. Because it's a long story why. I'm not going to cover that right here. Okay. God breathes lives. God makes you, you at birth. Directly. Your father is really God and no one else. And that's a strident theme of the Bible. That is why you're not evolved. The real you is immaterial like God is because God decreed it to be so. See? So, this is indirect. This is direct. By God directly. And here is the action that he does each time. And if you talk to any OBGYN, you'll find out that there's no breathing by the fetus in the womb, that the first thing they do when, they, when the fetus emerges from the womb is they have to clear the nostrils, and then the fetus exhales. Okay, so where did the inhale come from? It came right here. Any OBGYN, any doctor who delivers babies, ask them. What's the procedure in the delivery room? They, they unplug the nostrils. Yeah, and the baby exhales and cries. Okay, well then where did the inhale come from? Right here. So God made you. Whether you believe in him or not is beside the point, really. He made you. He wanted you. He directly made you. You don't have any other parents. And that's a main theme of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Okay? Now, why did he do it that way? Because, I mean, you know, I'm sitting here saying a thing, well, until I can prove why, I haven't accurately accounted for it. Okay, here's why he did it. This is God's evolution right here. The terrible translation, okay? Really crappy translation. There'll be a link in the video description showing the correct translation of this verse because I did one in a web page. Okay. This is translated by somebody who wanted God to be impressed by his own good deeds. So the translators who translated this were really just out of fellowship with God when they translated. But you don't have to be, you know, filled with the Spirit in order to translate. Translating one language into another language is a human skill. Okay, well, their human skill was incompetent here. Okay? When it says, I got to show you this because it's key to the whole. Okay. When it says, your spiritual service of worship, that's a pitiful translation. Okay? Logiken. Okay? Where is it? How do I? Yeah, here. Okay. Logikos. Do you remember John? Gospel of John, which is written later, but the idea was known already. God is the Word. We just saw back in Genesis, God speaks a thing and it exists. Okay. Paul is making wordplay on the Word. Okay. This is a secondary meaning. Okay? Belonging to the real nature isn't so bad. But this is secondary. This is the primary meaning. God speaks a thing and it exists. Okay? The real nature of God speaking causes a thing to exist. That's why we Christians are constantly saying the Word of God. The Word of God became flesh. That's the beginning of 1 John. I mean, John's Gospel. Okay, you're supposed to have the word in you. Lagos is the actual word. Logikos is the adjectival form of it. In other words, your worship, and that's right here, the word Latreia, okay? Your worship is to have the word in you. If you don't understand that, you will not understand this passage. Worship is to get the word of God in your head. Paul says that in every letter he writes. I'm sorry that the teachers are so stupid that they don't bother to show this. Okay? So it's your so-called spiritual service 
That's not what it says. The word is which is the word in you, and that is worship. Logikos latreia in the vocabulary form. Now look, this is God's evolution right here. What is the heart of the claim of Darwinian evolution? That you go from being one kind of being to transmute to being another kind of being. Darwin called it transmutation of the species. Now that would require magic. It does not work in genetics. Okay, but we're talking about God here. What did God say back in Genesis 1, 26, 27? We're going to make man in our image. God makes your soul directly. Okay? Do not be conformed, but be what? Transformed. And that's exactly what it means. Okay? Let's do the Greek so you can see it. All right? See? The word for conformed is... I can't even pronounce it rightly. Suskremati. Suskemati. Suskematizo. Okay, and that is right here. Right here. That's for conform. That means that go along to get along. That means whatever everybody else says, you say the same thing, and you're just going along with all your fellow humans agreeing with them without doing any thinking on your own. That's called being a parrot. That's what the King James only people are. They wouldn't know the Bible if it bit them because they never actually read the Bible. All they do is parrot what other people tell them. They are conforming. Paul is making a distinction in Romans 12, 2, see, get the word in your head. This is supposed to be word in your head is worship right here. Damn. Word in your head is worship is how that ought to be translated. So therefore, you're not supposed to be conformed to this world, the word, its words. See, he's making a play on the word. Don't be conformed to the world's words but be transformed by what? The renovation of your thinking is how that ought to be translated. With what? Well, see, remember it said logicane here? Words, whose words? Your words, the world's words, or God's words? God's words, obviously. Because how else are you gonna prove what the will of God is except with God's words? You see the point? God's word transforms you. You are to be transmuted, even though you're in this body, even though you're a human soul. God's thinking transmutes your nature to go along with the juridical salvation you got, 2 Corinthians 5.21, of his own righteousness imputed to you. You get a human spirit, that's how you can communicate with God. You therefore have to get God's words in your head and that renovates your thinking and that transforms you. Okay? And there's more to it, see, measure of faith, that's wrong. It means a standard of thinking from doctrine. The Greek word here is metron and it means a standard and it's talking about um, um, uh, God's own thinking allotted to you, your share of the booty of Christ, of his thinking. And the word faith here should be translated doctrine, Greek word is pistis, and it means the content of what is believed, and what is believed is a contract uh, deposited by someone who is pistas, faithful, depositing it in a temple, your body's a temple, and therefore you believe in it, because it's backed by the power of the gods. That was, it's a, a, a commercial word. It's not, it's not a religious term. It's a commercial term. The Bible is a contract, okay? You get your portion, your booty allotted to you in your head of that contract in your head and you believe it. And what that does therefore is that transforms you. This is God's evolution plan. You are to become more than human. This is what happened to Christ. 
He became the way, the truth, and the life. How? By getting the word in his head, that constitutes worship. That's the only way you can worship God. And that's in Hebrews 11, 6. I'm trying to, I don't want to skip around to too many verses. But go look up Hebrews 11, 6. The only way you can worship God, the only way you can please God is by getting the word in your head. Okay? So you are allotted your portion of the word in your head in which you believe and then that is the substance of the trial that's Hebrews 11 1 it's all about believing in the word and that transforms you that renovates your thinking from the human thinking which conforms to this world into the transformation the transmutation of knowing God See, uh, hopefully you understand, when God said back in Genesis, let us make man in our image, this is the way he does it. He first creates an immaterial soul. So you're immaterial and he's immaterial. you got that in common. Therefore, he can communicate to you. But the problem is sin. Sin puts us offline. Sin separates us from God. So Jesus Christ becomes, becomes transformed in his humanity into the way, the truth, and the life. You believe in his payment on the cross. That sets up the potential for you yourself to be able to be transformed. And therefore you get a human spirit so that you can understand spiritual information. That's 1 Corinthians 2. And therefore by learning that word, see that the word service should be translated words, the words of God, that constitutes worship. Okay, and it transforms your own thinking right there. So that you do, as it were, evolve into God's thinking. And it is an, an evolution. Okay, because it's a, a thing every day, a little bit. Line on line, precept on precept. Every day, a little bit. And you have learned X amount by the time you die. And then you're dead and you get a new body in heaven and then you keep on learning you keep on because God's infinite okay you keep on learning you keep on transforming forever and ever in heaven we will all keep on learning more about God because he's infinite I will always be finite but I will always learn more about how God is I will always see him better and the fact that we evolve to become like him is in first John chapter 2 right down here especially this verse right here this is a statement that we become like him see we will be like him that's God's evolutionary plan that we will be like him Paul also covers this in 1 Corinthians 15. There are many other verses. See, this is God's evolution. So yes, God is talking about evolution. But there's evolution that's indirect. And there's evolution that's direct. That he runs at all times. The human being is evolved all right. But evolved from God and by God and for God and to God. So that is... Is God's evolution. If I screwed up in my explanation, just let me know.